This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello and welcome to The Twilight Show. I'm Graham, and my special guest today is Christian Still, who works as a deputy head teacher and academic advocate of test enhanced learning in the UK. On today's show, we'll be talking about Christian's book, Test Enhanced Learning A Practical Guide to Improving Academic Outcomes for All Students. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Hello and welcome everybody to The Twilight Show. I'm Graham Stanley speaking to you live from Mexico City. And on today's show, I'll be talking to Christian Still about his book, Test Enhanced Learning. Christian is a deputy head at Academic Boundary Oak School, an independent private school in Hampshire. He has over 20 years experience as a head teacher and senior learner with an MS Ed in kinesiology. BSc in <laughs> sports scientists, science and a level five coaching and mentoring. Christian shares a keen interest in education leadership, evidence, informed practice, and edutech. So published in February 2023 by the award-winning Crown House Publishing, Test Enhanced Learning is an informative guidebook that explores the wealth of evidence behind and the benefits of test enhanced learning, space retrieval practice, and personalization. And the book details the most up-to-date research into improving learning and retention, takes us on a journey into test-enhanced learning, space retrieval practice, motivation, metacognition, and personalization. In so doing, Christian provides a blueprint for all teachers and schools to improve the academic outcomes of their students and to achieve this in ways that improve the motivation of learners and reduces the workload for teachers. You can find out more about the book by going to the following website, www.crownhouse.co.uk, and then forward slash test dash enhanced dash learning. Christian, I heard you laughing wow. at my mispronunciation of your MS said. I apology, apologize for that. So I believe you're in the studio now. Absolutely. Yeah. Kinesiology. Yeah. So the study of kinesiology. Uh, okay. Yeah. So uh, sports science background and uh, then off to do. Uh, a master's in kinesiology and the, it's a longer title but it's um it's psychology so it was starting to look at um pe uh, and psychology and then part of that um there's a bit of a wider look at uh, of, of psychology in general so yes it's uh, you know the cog psych world has uh, has been an interest for a while okay fantastic and um so uh, how are you doing today, by the way? I forgot to even ask you that. Everything going okay? <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been a lovely day. So uh, just recently uh, turned 49 and uh, we're just having uh, some family time. So it was really nice. So it's uh, it's been a nice Easter um, and I've been catching up on the uh, the research ed event up at Warrington. So uh, that's, that's been really nice uh, seeing the comments and seeing some familiar faces presenting there. So it's been good. Okay, fantastic. Is it actually your birthday today or is it your birthday weekend? Yeah, birthday weekend uh, yesterday. You know what it's like once you get past 40, uh, you know, you don't declare too much these days. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> yeah, recently 49. Oh, well, happy birthday for yesterday. Thank you. Then. Thank you. And um, so before we start talking about your book, Test Enhanced Learning, I'd love to ask you uh, or to – you know, to ask you about what a typical day or typical week for you is like, um, professionally, of course. Well, I, I think most teachers would um, share uh, busy. Um, it is certainly busy. Yeah. Um, but I'm very lucky to work with some wonderful colleagues and uh, some very experienced teachers. And the school that I'm working at um, at the moment, um, first of all, it's a, a really... Uh, well-run family feel school we talk a lot about its family feel and the children um, are fantastic very supportive parents um, and it's a beautiful setting and we really all look forward to summer at Boundary Oak because 
you know, it really is a joy. I, I go in, I like to start my day early. I like to try and be at my desk for half past six. And uh, I drive in and we're just getting to the point now where the sun's coming up and um, we're quite rural. So uh, there's a little copse in a field next door to the school where if you're really lucky, you see a family of deer in the morning and that's the start of my day. Um, and like many teachers, you know, it's preparing for the day ahead or the week ahead or the term ahead. And, and typically in a role of a senior leaders, you know, we tend to work two terms ahead. So there's obviously the work that's going on that day, but we're always thinking um, a little further ahead. And then teaching really is fantastic. Um, I'm teaching English uh, to the lower years in the senior school. And uh, I've just been working hard over the Easter break to get to know uh, much to do about nothing. Um, and I met up with one of my colleagues to talk about, about that. So teaching English um, predominantly uh, to children that are, are, you know, are keen uh, and thirsty to learn and, and doing a little bit of work actually around children that find the parents that are investing in an independent education for, for a number of different reasons. But sometimes it's because they want to make sure that their children are seen. And I've got some children that find um, school quite challenging um, for very real um, learning challenges around um, dyslexia, working memory. And I've been working really hard with with those children and their families. They've been helping me and I've been helping them, you know, no surprise, using testing as a, a way to, to help. But, um, yeah, doing a lot of reading and, and research and working with them at the rock face um, around working memory. So that's, you know, very much the day to day. And then it's curriculum. So we're looking at curriculum, extending the curriculum broadening the curriculum and, and Boundary Oak is a rapidly growing school. Um, you know, I think in the year alone, um, we've probably increased in 30 or 40 pupils, maybe close to 80 pupils over the last two years. So we're doing something right because more families are joining us. But of course, that presents new and different challenges. So in summary, very busy, thoroughly enjoying the teaching, thoroughly enjoying the leadership of teaching and thinking about curriculum. Um, and I'm also teaching uh, this term some some lower school, some prep, some year mm -hmm. four spelling. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to to working with my primary colleagues as well. Wow! So um, a very varied uh, week and day. Then it sounds like you have, and one that starts very early as well. Half past six in the morning is quite an early time, early start. Do you? Yeah. What time do you usually finish? So our teaching day finishes at four thirty. Um, and then two days a week, we are involved in a club. And that's a, a real uh, privilege, actually, because we, we get to broaden out and do some of the things that we really do love. So um, this term, I took a, um, a motivation from a charity in America called The Moth, and we did some stand-up storytelling. And so that was my club. And then one day a week, um, I'm on the what we refer to as prep or homework club. So two days a week, it's a 5.30 finish. And a race home for family dinner. You know, the deal is I better be at the dinner table by six o'clock or I'm in trouble. So <laughs> of course. it's busy. It's a long day. It's a long day, but it's a very enjoyable day. And the school do a great job of making sure that we're, we're supported during that school day. So it, it's different because obviously the first 20 years were in the state sector, which was a shorter but more intense day. Um, this is a longer day, very enjoyable day, but it is a long day. Okay, of course, yeah. Oh, it sounds it sounds like you've got a really uh, you've got a really nice working uh, atmosphere as well with a very idyllic setting, which is mm -hmm. is, is going to definitely uh, help, I think, as well, isn't it? Yeah, for, so, just for that general that general you know feel about yourself when you work up when you walk into school, you know, and it is a lovely setting. It does make a difference. I'm not uh, I'm not saying it it changes anything, you know, from the time the children arrive, but it does. Yeah, it's lovely to walk the grounds um, during the day. It's a real, it's a real treat. That's for sure. I can imagine. So, turning to your your book, Christian, um, it says on the website that you have been developing these ideas with your classes for many years, and you've achieved considerable success in terms of the direct learning games, improved assessment grades of the pupils, mm. and the indirect gains in students' growing confidence. I would uh, imagine that the idea for this book grew over time out of these observations and your experience in the classroom. But was there any one particular aha moment when you first saw testing as the key to improving student attainment? 
Well, that's a fantastic question. Um, so <laughs> I first came across the idea of using, um, you know, the common term that's out there, isn't it? As we know is, is retrieval practice. So I was aware of the press. I have a, I, I keep a, like a professional diary, a blog, and I actually have the, the blog entry when Carl Picky, um, Jeff Carl Picky was one of the, the main proponents of some of the research released the paper. He was at Purdue at the time. It was a Purdue release that said, you know, retrieval practice improves pupils' outcomes. And I tried to kind of adopt some of the ideas. You know, this is, you know, some more than 10 years ago, and there certainly wasn't a, um, a community of research enthusiasts. And, you know, it was pretty difficult. And, and I've still got the blog entry of me trying to do some of these retrieval type activities. And certainly the children, I can remember, you know, the children enjoyed the quizzing aspect, you know, that testing themselves against can they recall these certain items. And it was to do with a, um, an English language paper. And it was the elements of the, the, the essay that they had to write, you know, are they mm. going to in, include certain component parts? But it's very much like a shopping list. And, it, you know, and it was relatively successful. And we had children remembering quite a lot of the key ingredients that they needed to put into their work. Um, and these were children that were typically um, of low prior attainment. You know, there were very much those children that were sent to the English booster classes. And that quizzing activity fit really well. And I can remember that summer we were surprised that a number of children in that booster class that had got over the line and, and scraped as it was back then their, mm. their C. You know, these were the children that were forecast a D plus. Now, I'm not saying it was slowly the quizzing, but we, we had quite a, a, you know, a fun kind of competitive element to it. I'm a male teacher with a sports background. I was teaching English and PE at the time. Mm. And a number of these children were in the, the sports teams and I bumped into them a lot over in PE. You know, so was it fortuitous? You know, I had a relationship with some of the children that were successful in one area of school, but not in, in English. Um, but, you know, certainly the results kind of left me a, a pause for thought. Um, and I've always used, um, you know, I think all teachers use questions to different varying mm -hmm. degrees, but now it's very much a core part of what I do. And when I came back uh, to full time, I'd been a head teacher you know, led um, academics curriculum teaching right the way through um, assistant head VP up to head teacher. And I had the opportunity to go back into the classroom full time when I came back from the mm. Middle East. And, you know, four years ago, really started to, to look at using um, testing is the phrase. There's an issue with that very term, of course. So yeah. if we use quizzing, you know, I now quiz every lesson every lesson mm -hmm. and often more than once or twice a lesson and and the children's um, response is you know far what I what I thought it would be in fact if I don't quiz I come under more trouble than you know than than when I do so I think you know right from the offset I think children enjoy you know as we enjoy a pub quiz they enjoy being tested um, I think it's a mm -hmm. false depiction, really, when we, we say otherwise. I think the, the single moment came out is when I managed to um, get some children that were working in an all alternative provision unit at the school I was teaching through their yeah. first ever text. And I was kind of encouraged, but kind of there was a wry smile when I said that we're going to read a book together and the boys and there was one girl in there you know they'd never completed a book ever and right. uh yeah. the member of staff that was leading the unit you know their rice smile was well good luck if you can get them through the book you know but they loved the quizzing and we would read each chapter we would quiz before the chapter we would read the chapter and we would quiz after the chapter and it was the maze runner um oh yeah and, and the children absolutely loved you know testing themselves and sometimes we would test you know previous chapters or we would test about particular characters but yeah we 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 got through the maze runner we got through it within the within the term and and to this day a number of children said their greatest achievement was was reading their first ever book 
Oh, that's fantastic. That's really good. So what kind of things do you ask them before they were reading or before they'd even started reading the book? Was that just about what they expected from it, from the cover or the title or something else? Or? No, you see, it's really interesting. There's quite a lot of debate, you know, about what, of course, the, the key question is, you know, what do you quiz? And mm -hmm. I want them to know things about the book that are either important for them as they're going forward. So, you know, in the case of the Maze Runner, it was a question about, you know, did they understand that he was coming up in a lift and that lift was um, bringing him to the uh, the main area of the story? Now, you know, he was coming up from underneath the ground. They needed to know that um, and that was important. So, you know, these are very um, key points um, and certainly in the opening chapter, um, Thomas, you and I will, will know, you'll know the answer to this, Graham, you know, because of your wisdom but the children wouldn't. So Thomas is referred to as a greenie. His nickname is Greenie. Yeah. Now, unless the children understand what it is to be green, they won't understand why Thomas is considered a greenie. So that's one of the questions. You know, what do you think it is when someone's called green? They had no idea. You know, that's right. really, really course, important. Did, yeah. did, not some, did some of them not sort of jump uh, on the idea of them of of them being sort of ecologically aware, or is that wasn't that something that they thought they would uh, they associated with it rather than sort of a naive or? or yeah, you see, they the didn't case? they didn't even have the idea of they didn't have the association of naive, nor did they have the the association of um, you know uh, of eco issues. Um, these were children right. um, from a high daisy area which is um a reference to the the, the school's environment um as being low low social economic um so no no they had they had no idea so you know they didn't get the answer um mm -hmm. and we said well we'll see if we can come up with that a little bit further on and one of the other questions is what makes the boy's stomach sour with nausea and i had to tell them that nausea was a the posh word for being sick so right. At that point, you know, what would make you you feel sick? I think they said things like, you know, being on a boat, um, being on a roller coaster was one of the answers I think I can recall. And I said, well, that's great. Well, let, let's look out to see what caused him being sick. Now, what causes Thomas to be sick is arriving in an elevator that sways. Um, mm. So where has he come from? Underneath the ground into this beautiful idyllic place that's called a glade. So I asked them if they knew what morals were. And I asked them if they knew what curiosity was. And I asked them if they knew what a glade was. And now these are all key pieces of vocabulary about the text. I think we ask five questions and then we get on and read. Mm. But of course, what happens is, is that you then bump into this comment where Thomas gets called a greenie. There it is. There it is. Well, there we are. Spotted it. <laughs> okay. All right. Great. Well done. You know, yeah, you spotted it. So what do you think they're referencing? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's funny so this is this is what we um refer to now is is pre-testing and right. and not only is pre-testing really good for them to you know to you see now they're reading the text you know this whole thing about you know looking at the book and the difference between looking at the book and reading well they're reading because they're trying to find out when this word greeny turns up and of course yeah. you know there's a lot of house points floating around in, in this environment. So there was a house point if they found it and, you know, could they tell me how old they thought he was? Um, mm -hmm. And I think, I think the phrase is um, a 16 year old boy, uh, you know, he awakens in this lift. You know, again, these are all things that they were kind of looking for. Now that's an indirect effect of testing. You, you know, they're now kind of searching for the answer, but the other benefit mm -hmm. is that at the end when we could quiz them, and we could say to them, what is the implication of him, you know, being called a greenie? He's, he's new, uh, you know, or he's naive um, or he's inexperienced, I think is the word that we used. So right. you get these forward effects, you know, of, of improved concentration and focus. And then, of course, you know, that also then extends that they know that information better next lesson. Because the first thing I asked them was, you know, what colour was, was Thomas? Now, you know, there aren't many colors you would call somebody as a nickname so the fact that i was asking them you know a color they were pretty pretty certain it was green and he was greeny great so shall we see what happens to greeny next shall we off we go 
great. That's really interesting, Christian. Um, I have moved away. We've moved a little bit away from the book, though. So at what point did you sort of decide that this was something that you thought was worth writing a book about, the, the test-enhanced learning or the quizzing, et cetera? Yeah, did that come because there, there wasn't another book about it, or did you think that you, you could add something to what had already been um, written about? So there's a lot of work about retrieval practice and, mm -hmm. um, you know, this idea of this low hanging fruit, um, we can ask children to recall things and, you know, that, that does the, that does the job, but it, it's interesting. It's kind of like the lag, I suppose, in research through to, to the classroom. So at that time, the research that was being shared was still very much the research from Jeff Karpicki's work, um, Rodiger's work, which is in the early to 2006 through to 2012 13 and of course you then have a period of research from then through to to the current research you know and there's been an awful lot written about this we're at the point now where there are meta studies written about the studies and what was really interesting is that it was just kind of presenting this idea that retrieval practice alone was sufficient and that was a, an article I wrote for secondary education saying retrieval practice alone is not enough. Just knowing about mm -hmm. retrieval practice, we've already introduced, a, you know, another point, you know, post-testing, retrieving the backward effects is one area, but there's loads of forward um, testing or potentiated learning benefits. But that's literally the, you know, that's one chapter of, I think, nine, is it? So I think the point being was is that people were very keen to adopt this and we were starting to see strategies being used in classrooms. Um, and, and I think perhaps um, we weren't doing the processes as an, you know, you know, sufficient justice. This is a whole area of cognitive psychology. There are labs and a number of labs dotted around the world that are looking at this and different aspects of this. And, and we kind of wrapped it up into this you know, quick quiz at the beginning or at the end of the lesson. Um, and I felt that there was a lot more to, to cover. And, you know, retrieval practice is just one part of a bigger area that has a terrible name <laughs> called Test Enhanced Learning. <laughs> so you, you're not a fan of the name, are you? Um, well, one of the, you know, probably the most prominent writers at the moment is uh, Professor Agarwal. And, and she pleads um, with us not to use the word testing because the process is retrieving um, and hence why she's very much in support of the term retrieval practice. So I will often talk about test enhanced learning um, of which retrieval practice is one component. Um, yeah. So no, I, I actually quite like the phrase um, mm -hmm. only that testing is considered really bad. So I'm hoping there's a, a lot of teachers that, you know, read a little bit beyond the fact I'm not just saying that that testing should be terminal. That's the problem that we have. I think Dr. Perry writes about it in his introduction. Testing has a really bad name. Um, but quizzing enhanced right. learning, I, was, <laughs> I don't think anybody would know there's, that you won't find many research papers on quizzing enhanced learning. All the papers refer right. to, to test enhanced learning because the research back at the start of the century was about the testing effect. Um, of course. So, so it's it a problem. Makes sense. Sense. The title makes sense, basically. <laughs> yes, it's, yes. It's, Only it's I don't easily want to... understood. Well, I don't know if it's going to sell many books in the American market unless I can explain, you know, because certainly testing in America is even more, um, uh, you know, more of a frustrated term. Testing has a really bad, um, a bad rap sheet and, you know, Really what it is, it's about getting the children to think hard about what they know to improve the depth and the strength of what they know. And, and that just was too long a title for the book. Of course. And I, there's a comment in the studio at the moment. Chris Fry from Barcelona says, quizzes sounds much nicer than tests, he says. So there you go, I think. It's Chris is right. Um, <laughs> 
So, Christian, um, what can potential readers, uh, apart from what you've already mentioned, what what else can potential readers expect to find in the book? And I know also that the book is supported by an app, I think, called Remember yeah. More too, which I'd love to hear more about. Well, what can what can they get back? So, you know, I'm a school leader at heart, and this is a tremendously challenging and demanding profession. So, um, two things. Quizzing will improve your children's outcomes, point number one. Uh, point number two, um, it will also reduce teachers' workload. And, th and that's really where, you know, the determination to, to keep pushing and sharing this. So there's no doubt that asking children to recall what they've already learned or, as we've shown, what they're about to learn has huge benefits to um, their long term. This is the key part their long-term retention, not just the immediate retention. So, you know, we want the children to thrive uh, and there are loads of other spin-offs. In fact, there's a fantastic paper by um, Rodiger, Henry Rodiger, um, who has as many um, senior positions in cognitive science as anybody. You know, he is the messy, shall we say, of the cog psych world. There are Ronaldos mm -hmm. and others out there too, um, who wrote a paper about the 10 benefits. So largely, they are direct. Your children will retain information for longer, but there's all sorts of indirect benefits. And, and confidence is probably the big one. Um, and obviously, directing children's attention, you know, go back to the Maze Runner. They're looking for the word um, that's going to describe this character. So they're paying attention to the text. So there's those benefits. Um, in terms of teachers, if you spend a little time with test enhanced learning, you start to shrink your curriculum focus and you start deciding what is absolutely essential. And when you decide what is essential to learning and when you spend time quizzing that, the recommendation is, is that it's not a, you know, Graham Nuttall's famous book, Hidden Lives of Learners. You know, there's a lot about three being an important number. You need to come across that information three times. The first time makes a huge difference if you're asked to remember. The second time, equally so the third time, but they are decreasing. That three times, four times is a sweet spot. So of course, that's one set of resources that I use three, four, five, six, seven times um, with the children. And of course, mm -hmm. you start you start accruing efficiencies. The children come into the class. I have 10 questions on the board or five questions on the board, depending where we are. You know, beginning of a scheme of learning it will be less. Um, but they'll be up on the board. And, you know, when I go to work tomorrow, they are expecting five questions about much ado about nothing. I guarantee you that's the first thing they'll say is what's our quiz today. And it will be three things about much ado about nothing, you know, to help them get started with that. So there's a lot of benefits on routines um, and they have to pay attention. Graham, Chris, I hope uh, in the background is paying attention to this, this conversation because there's going to be a quiz about it at the end of our talk. Now there's a reason <laughs> to pay attention to the learning, right? You know, of there's going to be a question about the book that we talked about and the character. Chris, yeah. Chris says he's ready, so he's ready and waiting <laughs> for any quiz that you might be uh, asking later. But isn't that interesting? He's ready. He's already enthused about the idea. This is the point we started the show with. People like to yeah. be quizzed. You know, we go to you look at the number of shows on TV around quizzes and pub quizzes. Yeah. You know, people like to be quizzed. And that's the key point about test enhanced learning. It's not this negative idea that testing is bad. You know, I regularly um, share commentary from the students. I've got a, a young lady, uh, she'll love it that I've named her. I won't use her last name mm -hmm. because of course people know where I work, but young Matilda says, we don't get tested in Mr. Steele's class. The only thing we're being tested about is whether we want to be smarter or not. And what she's saying is what she's learned is the questions are available in the lesson. They're also available online. If she wants to do better in class, she goes through the questions. She comes to class happier because she knows the questions she's going to be asked and she's learned the answers. So I, I guess now it's I can do all the interesting things. Definitely. Sorry, Graham. I th yeah, sorry, sorry, Christian. Um, I guess it's also it's a way of the, the, the learners knowing whether they have understood um, what they should understand 
from if they're able to answer the questions that you've put on the board by the end of the lesson, for example, then that will be kind of like a measure of feedback. It, it is, in a way, it's almost it's it's encouraging sort of autonomous learning as well, isn't it? Look, you're absolutely right. So um, the students knew that much ado about nothing was new to us or new to me. It was going to be the first time I was going to teach it in the summer. And they knew that the deck was going to get released sometime over the Easter break. I think I published it on Thursday. There is seven hours and 22 minutes invested by that class already looking at the context of much ado about nothing. I said, if I get it out there, you know, let's start by looking at the context. And there are, there are two classes that are studying it. So that's 40 children and they've done seven hours and we don't go back to school until Monday. And I haven't told them that they need to do anything. I've just said to them, I oh, will release the deck. So that seven hours will probably be a couple of children that are, you know, perhaps very committed, but that seven hours of teaching I've already gained and I haven't even got there. It's just available well, to them. So that's seven. Let me, let me see if I understand that. That's seven hours that before you've even started teaching this group, that's seven hours mm -hmm. that collect, collectively they've put into the, the play. In learning the, and just one act, one aspect of the play, which is the context of the play the context. and the characters, the characters and the context. I think I said, if they were going to start ahead of me, that's where they were doing. That's 40 children. And I could jump onto the app and it would tell me exactly who, but uh, I could do that while we were talking, but you know, but I know I looked this morning, there were seven hours and I presume it will be more by the time I get there Monday because the children want to turn up and say, yeah, I know who the characters are. I, kn I want you to know that I know that, you know, that Beatrice and, and Benedict are, you know, are two couples. Now, this piece of information in the deck simply tells you who the character is and a little bit about them. But what a great place mm -hmm. to start. Wow, yeah, that, that's really it, – it, you're starting ahead of, of how you would normally approach it uh, if you were teaching this traditionally, wouldn't you? Well, in the fact that they know that there are 17 characters. So if you jump on to classroom.rememberMore or you use the app, either one, and they select the characters, it tells you there are 17 cards. And what we learn about um, these different characters, let's have a look at um, Beatrice, who's one of the lead characters. You know, we learn that she's Leonardo's niece. She's quick-witted, intelligent, and stubborn. They already have a picture of this young female character um you know that's a, that's a great place to start so yeah there there are some that are very very committed um you know we've got children that pride themselves on on learning when you have a collection of cards um, or flash cards we refer to it as a deck and and regularly we have children that pride themselves on you know how much of the deck that they can um retain and use and what's really interesting from a teacher, from my point of view, is just how much information I try and teach the children about these plays. You know, if you take much to do about nothing, by the time you've picked up all the characters, a little bit about the context and just the plot line, just the plot line of the play, there are, and I've been quite conservative, I've tended to, to scale things back, but I'm just having a look now. In terms of the plot line, there are 70 key bits of information. Now, I'm not expecting the children to learn and know and have these forever because that's not the purpose of learning a text, but they're going to bump into 70 items. And I just think it's phenomenal when you start to think about how much information you're expecting the children to know. But one thing we do a lot of um, is we identify key vocabulary. So to understand much ado about nothing – you need to know what the word illegitimate is. One of the characters mm -hmm. happens to be the illegitimate brother of another. You need to know what that means. Otherwise, you're going to find it very difficult to understand much to do about nothing. And you're going to need to know words like infidelity and chaste and cockold. This one's for Chris. That's your first question, Chris. Your first question in the quiz is, do you know what the word cockold means? That's not for airing beyond the uh, the term. Um but it's really interesting. It's not a word that they're, you know, very traditionally. It's uh, not. It's not a word. That, it's not a word that we use these days, is it? Really? No, 
No, not at all. But again, absolutely crucial to to the play and the breakdown of one of the relationships. So, you know, it's it is fantastic. And, you know, we'll we do a lot of work with literacy, a lot of work with, you know, key vocabulary. Um, you know, and we're very particular about it because, you know, the one thing you 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 become sensitive to when you become enthused about using testing is that you can't cover all the material you know you have to be quite disciplined um and you know i know already before i teach next term um what i want the children to know um all of my quizzes are written and all of their homeworks are at some point spaced out across the the term learning this information so that's a huge reduction in my workload Fantastic. And Chris does say he does know what the meaning of that word is. <laughs> Fantastic. He's a better man than me. He was a better man he than me. <laughs> he also has uh, a question, which is, what are the other components of test-enhanced learning apart from retrieval practice? <clears throat> okay, so the first thing I need to do is correct myself or correct us. So when we talk about retrieval, the most important thing about retrieval is repeated retrieval. You know, one asking right. them to remember it one time is is not going to do us a great deal of um, good. And so, you, number one, you use you use in the website, I think, in the description that I read was spaced retrieval practice as well. Is that? Yeah. So there's two the parts you're picking up there. Yeah, you're, you're picking up on two parts there, Graham. Actually, so the first thing is repeated yeah. retrieval. They need to come across that information more than once on the initial learning. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're coming across the the, the term cuckold in a, in a lesson, you might want to say, let's look out for it when we're reading this particular act. Oh, look, there it is. What was it? Can we remember? And then you might use that again as an activity to leave. Can everybody remember the word? And that sounds rather rude that Shakespeare uses to describe a man whose wife is, is potentially sleeping with other men without his knowledge. All right. So I've actually given them the information. All they've got to remember, you know, the word beginning with C. So we've covered that three times. So the, the kind of rule of thumb is when you first learn it, you need to come across it three times. And ideally, you need to come back to it three times. So three plus three is the way we help uh, teachers think about that. And the second three is the three spaced opportunities. So we might learn about it on day one. We might come back to it a number of times in the play just because it it, it does. But, you know, three plus three is the, the main thing. So... We would have come across it in class. They no doubt would have come across it in their first homework, um, which is all self-directed. And then, you know, we're going to come across that numerous times. Um, so that's the, the first two, repeated retrieval. And you're right, spaced retrieval. And what's really interesting when you do this and the, the knowledge becomes really resilient, it's amazing how many times children refer back to vocabulary that we did last term two terms ago i've actually got a group from last year and they still reference key power vocabulary that we learned the year before oh we covered that in this deck you know the, the strength of these memories when you work like this is is quite phenomenal so repeated retrieval and spacing then the other areas that touch on it um which perhaps are a little trickier is something called successive relearning. So that old mm -hmm. adage of, uh, you know, what do you do when you get it right? Keep, keep going. All right. Getting it right is really important, but try, try, try again. When you get it right, get it right, go again, get it right, go again. So this idea of successful retrieval and doing that more than once. A little picture around interleaving, which I'm sure many of your listeners would have would have heard about. This idea of that once the information is learnt, and I'll say that again, once the information is secure and it has been learnt, and you understand the process, it's then applying that to different situations. So the idea in a textbook where you learn a number of um, different processes, and then you have a questions that have a variety of different surface structures, um, and then you have to decide what um, process to apply. So interleaving. And then the one that's really coming through fast in the research at the moment is the use of feedback. Um, and, and that's really key. 
um, pretty much getting to the right answer is always key, but there's quite a lot of work around, around that. And then we're starting to look at the motivational elements of it. And of course, in this technology world, um, we can do some work with technology to make sure that the children are, are getting the right information at the right time. Now, we use the term personalization um, in the book. Mm -hmm. There's some fantastic research by um, Dr. Svenja Heitman, and she refers to it as adaptive quizzing. Now, it doesn't actually need technology, um, but any type of adaptive quizzing, you, you're going to get a gain of somewhere between 15 and, and 17%. So if you can make sure that the children are being asked the questions that they need to be asked, wow, then you know you're going to get a you're going to get a bang for your buck. And the easiest way to do that is obviously to use some type of digital format. So that's the the package that is test enhanced learning. The other things that are indirect, um, you know, are equally important. Children attend more, they focus on the lesson more, they write more notes. Here's a great one for you. They turn up to school more, they have better attendance. Um, they have greater confidence in themselves. They have greater confidence in the subject. And these are all different research papers. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that the one thing that stands out for me is that the children participate more, um, particularly those children that are on the fringes or, or slightly quieter. There's a nice analogy one of the students gave um, about Mr. Still's lessons. I go to lessons and I feel like I'm a poker player. And when the teacher asks me the question, I've got to go all in. I've got, you know, if I'm going to put my, my hand up, I am putting all my chips and I am risking everything. Because if I get this question wrong, you know, I feel in trouble. But when I go to Mr. Still's class, I already know the question. I already know the answer. So I'm willing to bet all in. And this is a really interesting kind of thought for him. He didn't take part in lessons because answering questions was a risk. Right. You know, why and would the you, risk why of, would you risk all that? Yeah, the risk of, of of trying to answer without knowing whether you're actually saying the the, the thing that is the, the, the answer basically. So in other words, in, in your lesson with this methodology, then answering the question is something that they're more confident that they know the right answer because of what you've just yeah. described. Shall we say they're remembering that they know. Right. That's interesting. That's you know, interesting. And, and I think there's a lot in, in this. Um, another, you know, fantastic educator, Simon Knight, works in the special, um, special sector, special educational needs sector, special education. And he talked about errorless learning today errorless learning you know we're not going to allow the children to get things wrong and this is the you know one thing i would certainly say i've learned if you lower your failure rates now errorless isn't so good for for learning um in perhaps a, a different sector you know but we're still talking about rates of success in excess of 85 90 percent there's quite a bit of research floating around now get your success rates up much much higher you know it's not guess what's in your teacher's head look here is a question you know we've looked at this answer beforehand you should know it okay if you don't that's fine you're just going to drop it you're going to jot it down but look for success rates much closer to 90 if you want to flip that phrase lower your failure rates to 10 percent and the climate yeah. changes the climate's bound to change much smaller steps, much quicker. And people say, well, how, you know, how we got time for that? Well, one of the things, you know, uh, and I don't want to upset teachers, um, but one of the things that I, I think teaching is going to look at quite um, conscientiously over the next few years will be the time spent giving feedback. <clears throat> Feedback's mm. extremely expensive and time costly. So, yeah, I'm going to give a presentation next week on... Uh, you know, is feedback a waste of time? Controversial, of course, it's important, but, you know, it is time expensive whether you like it or not. So would your position be to reduce the amount of feedback you give or to change the way that you give feedback? Um, can I pick a C? Can I pick option C? Of course, of course. Write questions 
with higher diagnosticity so the children get it right, i.e., right. what word beginning with C describes a man whose wife is having extramarital affairs. Okay, so <clears throat> again, if I want you to get to the answer, I can give you more help. What color mm -hmm. describes Thomas? You know, uh, what color is used to describe Thomas would be quite accessible. But if I really wanted to make sure you didn't get it wrong, I'd say what color describes Thomas beginning with G? Because how many other colors other than gray do you know begin with G? Right. And so I could make it easy, giving... couldn't I? I could say... I could say five letters long, beginning with G, ending in N. <laughs> you know, you've still got to think about it, haven't you? Even though you know it begins with G and ends in N, it's got five letters. You've still got to think, are there any other colours other than green? Of course, the, the children will still be trying to retrieve that information, basically, even though you're giving Correct. them more support in getting it right. So that was what Correct. you were saying before of being minimising the percentage of them getting the answers wrong and then you're improving their confidence and their retrieval perfect and there's a tiny caveat as long as the hint that's what they're called in the trade as long as the hint doesn't give away the answer right then you're fine i mean g doesn't give it away because you, you'll still be thinking about colors five letters beginning with g you know you might double check how you spell gray but you know we are you know, we're pretty much getting close to, to green. You know, but if we stay with colours, if I, maybe we can get Chris to help. If we ask Chris to type into the chat um, his answer. Are you ready, Chris? So um, I'm looking for a letter. Sorry, I'm looking for a colour that is six letters long. Now, this question has poor diagnosticity. Because he could write any number of colours. Okay, Chris. Ready to go. So, write a color. Uh, sick purple is what Chris is coming okay. with. Fantastic, and that is actually a correct answer, but it's not the correct answer I'm looking for. We've all been in the classroom when we've done that, but it wasn't quite the answer I was looking for. Okay, so <clears throat> here it is. It's a color. It's got six letters, and two of those letters are the same. Could also be purple, couldn't it? It could be purple. Yeah, that's why I kind of used it. He's going to come up with another one. He's going to come up with yellow. And that's the right answer. And the interesting thing is, is that still required. I'm sure Chris will tell, tell us he had to think really hard. And he probably thought of yellow and then realized it had two letters, two L's in it. You know, we do the same sorts of thing, you know, a, you know, a color without um, any letters, uh, you know, all used only once. So there's another fun question. Now that one, there is only, as far as I'm aware, um, orange on that one. So it's about the diagnosticity of the class. All I want you to remember is that Thomas was called Greeny. So, mm -hmm. you know, what colour beginning with G? And the more important thing is, is why is he called Greeny? Do you remember what that mm -hmm. was? That's your follow-up. So <clears throat> again, what I don't want to spend is, is spend, you know, or misallocate time on long winded feedback or, or dancing you need to know that tom was green because he's green because he's naive he's new to the glade that's it simple yeah okay and if you that ask chris sense. did he have fun he'd say yeah i'm sure he had good fun answering those did you have fun chris right <laughs> answering the chat <laughs> more importantly did he have to think hard Yes to the fun. Let's see what he says about thinking hard. Were you challenged, Chris? No answer yet, but uh, yeah. I'm sure it's coming. <laughs> it's keeping us waiting, Christian. Um, while we're waiting for Chris to answer, uh, oh, here it is. Yes, a bit. Yes, he said. So they had a bit of fun. <laughs> um, so, well, uh, I think I'm writing thinking that although you're an English teacher and have taught PE, that this type of 
your book and this type of methodology, this test enhanced teaching and learning is something that could be applied and is suitable for all teachers in all settings. Is that the case? Yeah, you think? yeah absolutely. The only thing that we have to be mindful of is in the younger age groups, the, the access to their working memory reduces. So, you know, questions typically benefit from being shorter Again, diagnosticity, you know, how well does the question or the cue point to the answer needs to be a little bit higher. But absolutely, you know, it's about dealing with your substantive knowledge. It's it's quite freeing, actually, because when the children have a broad base of information, which, by the way, works brilliantly for homeworks, you know, jumping on and doing these questions or revisiting, revisiting questions, it enables you to spend more time helping them know how to use that knowledge. And I think that's the key thing. You know, there's a really lovely paper um, written by Dr. Stephen Chu, you know, that's saying that knowing stuff is not the same as being able to use it. I don't want to spend my time or the class's time or the lesson time with information that I can just say to them, you know, know what this is. Once we know what that is, I will help them decide how we're going to use that. So for me, you know, lessons... Uh, and test enhanced learning yes it's about learning new information or acquiring new information so it becomes knowledge um absolutely but the bigger point about it is that in class i want to be using my expertise um for more purposeful uh, reasons than than you know helping them learn 15 words or the definitions of 15 words which they can quite do on their own from what age five six six years of age mm-hmm. they can define a definition no problem so and I think for the colleagues that are working in high density curriculum areas like geography and history, I think it's almost essential, you know, give them the terms that you're going to be covering in the lesson and ask them to turn up to the lesson, at least with, you know, being able to spell them correctly wouldn't be a bad thing. As a PE teacher, you know, I loathe the word specificity um, and the number of times I had to get the children to, you know, to correct that. And of course, I'm now not correcting that every time in their in their work, you know, because we spend time. You know, this is a key word. This is how you spell it. And we use um, the flashcards in reverse. So we'll give them the definition and they'll have to spell the word specificity. So, you know, there's quite a bit of flexibility with this. But, yeah, essentially, it's all about time. Fantastic. And I'd like to know a little bit more about the the app uh, that goes with the book. Is that an app that is just for the teachers to use or do the students use that app as well? The Remember so, More app. <laughs> yeah, so let's give you the, the shortened version. So we built it, myself and a, a software developer, um, and it's available to schools. Classroom mm-hmm. just enables teachers to present these questions, these flashcards in a classroom mm-hmm. super fast. So right. if you wanted to put up the maze runner, you would go to classroom.remembermore, you would select the maze runner and those questions are up on the screen. There is no login, it's there. We, we joke, you know, if you want to use classroom, you can deliver questions or test enhanced learning in less than 10 seconds. Then people laugh at me and say that that's not possible. And it is. Type in the website, choose the deck, click go. It's, it's really as simple as that. I've just if done it. To- and I can oh, say it is okay. <laughs> so while you were talking. Yeah. Wonderful. So, so there, and of course, the, the biggest issue there is that, you know, is writing the questions. And as a department, I would recommend that a department would want to write the questions. Great for heads of department to know that all the classrooms now are delivering the same knowledge so that next year when the next teacher picks them up, they've all had the same core knowledge. Okay, we'll leave, you know, school leadership to one side. If a school or a department wants to use the app, they just drop me a note and they get their own classroom and it has a forward slash and the school's initials and then they have access to a dashboard. And in the dashboard, they can put all their content in. And in the dashboard, they can see whoever is using Remember More with their content. And all the children do is they download the app and you could even test this, Chris, in the background or yourself, Graham, And you type in the school's group code. So we use a group code called Demo School. Of course, you know, whatever school you're at. So at Boundary Oak, we use BOS, Boundary Oak School. And then they get my content or the content I want them. 
And that's it. I mean, it is literally done in seconds. Download the app, type in your group code, BOS, and then whenever the child uses the app, you get to see their, their work. So what I typically do is we have 20 minutes worth of reading and I talk to the children about what they're reading and I have them do 20 minutes of remember more every week. And I direct them. I say, I want you to do this. Now, the bit that's really clever is that that homework then is personalized to each individual learner. If they're struggling with a particular set of questions or a particular set of definitions, that's what the app does. As a cohort, not only, not only can I see each child, but as a cohort, I know that they are struggling with question number eight. And I can give you an example. We were teaching holes and they didn't understand what a spigot was. I showed them a picture in class. The children went, oh, so that's what a spigot is. Okay, it's a type of tap. They didn't have any reference point for it. I think it's a fairly American word. And then by next week, that card, you know, had gone from being, you know, weakly uh, understood or the children had low confidence. And the following week, you know, that had slowly started to, to remediate it. But if we were taking something more serious, like a particular science term or, you know, they were stuck on a particular question, mm-hmm. you know, it gives teachers the, the foresight, shall we say, or the insight to address a particular, um, a particular card. And there's lots of other things that you can do with the cards, um, you know, the way it's set up. Um, what's key about Remember More is children can look at different slices of information. So in a text, it might be a particular chapter or it might be a particular character in a particular character, uh, sorry, in a particular chapter. Um, you know, that's what it does. And, you know, children at Boundary Oak School use it themselves. Um, some people put their own content in for revision. Um, but at the moment, mostly it's staff putting together information and, and just sharing it with that. And it's a philanthropic project. Um, if it will help, you know, you drop me an email. I People will typically say, oh, could I have the Macbeth deck or could I have the Romeo and Juliet deck? And then people kind of share decks back. And yeah, we just make it available. It's it's a, a nice way to help teachers. Wow, sounds great. Um, that's really interesting, Chris Christian. Um, I think um, I'm right in saying that you you need to go on the hour. Is that right? So I think we should no, probably. I'm happy to answer any questions, Graham. I've got a little bit of time. Um, I'm more conscious of your time. Okay, well we can we can go on a little bit uh, longer than I thought. Uh, I thought we had to wrap up within the hour. So uh, I don't want to keep you away from your birthday celebrations, Christian. <laughs> Well, how, should we make a? Should we do another ten minutes, Graham, and then we can? Okay. Uh, if there's any key questions that we want to get answered or I can help with, I'm happy to do that. Sure. Um, Chris is gone, so he doesn't have any more questions. But um, what I'd like to talk about, I think, is a little bit more about um, how, in your book, the test enhanced uh, teaching actually. Uh, sorry, test enhanced learning, actually how that links with motivation. So how do you think, apart from what you've already talked about, the fact that Mm -hmm. quizzing anyway is something that is motivating for learners to do, what other aspects of motivation do you think that this type of methodology helps with? So how does it motivate the students? Yeah, look, this is probably the dark horse in this kind of package. So Bjork himself has just said, you know, we, we've probably got to take into account some of the emotive elements. You know, children, um, you know, they don't sit in a laboratory uh, when they're doing this work. You know, they're in the classroom. Yeah. The, the first thing is we talked about the success rates. Now, we know that success and motivation is bi-directional. And that's taking a little while to hit the the, the classrooms and, and the teacher training. So... You know, we used to think, you know, we'd have motivated children and they'll be successful. There's a lot to say that, you know, give children success and, uh, you know, they will become motivated. So the key thing for me with with test enhanced learning is, is that when you write them, you write and you design the questions, 
you get the children to the answers. So in Remember More, there's a little pop-up. So you have your question, you know, what was the, the nickname given to Thomas? And you just can't remember. If you hit the little question mark, it will say, you know, it's a color and it begins with G. Now, this is the really key thing. There's some fantastic papers that say if children are given hints, they will go ahead and complete the homework and they will answer the questions. Now, they don't even have to use the hints for it to have an impact. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. the idea that there is somebody holding their hand there. So, you know, the idea that I can get help if I want it. I think the crazy thing is, is that the kids do the quizzes without using the hints, it, you know, but if they have the same quiz without hints, you know, they, they, they stop. It's, it's a really crazy um, piece of research. It's really quite cleverly done. So, you know, the idea is that children want to be successful um, in terms of being in the classroom. You know, if it's new information, and we're very clear about this in the book, then, you know, treat it very carefully and give children lots of help in getting to the answer. Now, at some point, that information becomes knowledge. And you'll find that test enhanced learning is super efficient in helping children maintain, retain and maintain knowledge. So we've got two very distinct parts there to your question. In terms of motivation, nobody likes getting it wrong. You know, get the questions up on the board. Make sure that the failure rate is really low. Tell them you don't expect them to do as well because it's new information. Show them the answers and the children have responsibility for writing down or upgrading or uplifting their answers. If, for example, the question is, you know, how do we describe Thomas? And the answer is green E. That's the exact answer. And the child only wrote down green. <clears throat> we would say to them, really well done but make sure that your answer is the same as the answer up on the board. Now I've got 20 children, 30 children in the class. They can see the answer up on the board and they can self-assess. Now that's the key point that they improve their understanding or they improve their retention of the correct answer. I'm pretty much <coughs> guarantee you that they'll get that right next time around and they will write down greeny. Now when the lesson then progresses, and we're into the main part, and the child uses the correct term, that's when you say, and you are spot on, you're right, well done, young lady, greeny, absolutely brilliant. Where did you get that from? And more often than not, they don't say the book, they say the quiz. So the last piece of the puzzle in terms of motivation is for the children, A, to know it works. So there's lots of evidence you can use to tell them that quizzing works. They've got to believe it works. So you've got to remind them when it does work for them. So they've got to have knowledge of it. They've got to believe in it. And then they've got to be committed to it. So we don't set do 30 questions. We say you do 20 minutes. Every child does 20 minutes. And if they don't do 20 minutes, we ask them why. When we do our weekly, should we call it medium stakes quiz? Once a week, we actually do a, a little bit more formal quiz. We ask them, have you done your homework? And we ask them to forecast their grade. What's really interesting, the children that don't do the homework or have missed the homework, you know, they still want the same results, but they don't get them. So we, we say to them, you know, you've got to know it works. You know it works. You've seen it works. You know, you've got to believe it works. Here it is. You've got to be committed. When are you going to do your 20 minutes? Remember more. Here's the crazy thing. Even when the children know it works, even when the children have spent, you know, maybe a whole term with me and they've got better grades and they often do. When you say to them, you know, when are you going to plan to do your retrieval or you'll remember more, they often miss that step. You absolutely have to get them to be committed and plan the time when they're going to do this stuff. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they don't. That's part of the motivation. You know, children are not very good at regulating their learning. One of the things that right. Remember More does is it actually gives them that information you know, you've learned this much of the, the, you know, you're confident with this many cards. You've done this much time. So I can say to them, don't expect to get a great grade when you've only done 30% of the required time. So I don't tend to be quite so disciplined in terms of, you know, you've missed a homework. That's your detention. What I'll say to them is, you know, you're expected to have done 60 minutes. You've done 40. You need to close this gap. 
If they don't close the gap, then they get their detention. But more often than not, I'll say to them, it's on you. Close the gap. We have that phrase quite a lot, close the gap. So especially in more, in more difficult schools. And what the teachers like about it is I can actually mark my homework in you know, minutes. I put, the, oh, I put the, the splash up on the board. You know, It tells me how many minutes you've done. And it tells me what you know and you don't know. Well, you know, if you don't do the work, don't expect the grades. I'm quite quite mean like that. Oh, it makes sense. And what you've just explained as well is, is a form of feedback as well, isn't it, really? The, the students are getting the feedback from the app and from seeing what they have done or what they haven't done, what they've still got left to do. Yeah, and that's you. You make a really good point, Graham. It is very much, you know, we've got different kids, kids that are working through the deck, you know, and they're working their way out. And then there's others that have I've only got this much left to learn. It's really you, you remind me of a really good point. You know, some people are working their way out, and some people are already saying, right, this is my target. I want to learn the whole deck, and then you know, I've only got twenty percent left. You know, but it, it is it is such a leveler because. You know, by the time the children get, I think it is into the end of year six, I think it's 83% of all children in year six have got a phone and that goes up to like 90 something percent in year seven. So, you know, remember Moore's on their phone. We had lots of kids doing in the, in the state sector. We had a lot of kids doing it on the bus to school, a lot of kids doing it on the bus at home, on the way home from school. Um, I didn't have really any issues with homework because there was no excuse. You know, you hit the remember more button, mm. you you click review, you're up and running, you're loading time, you know, you're you're investing time. So I will say the motivation comes around really, really quickly because they turn up to class and they've got a whole stack of words that they've never had at their disposal. You know, let's take it again, much ado about nothing, words like illegitimate and chaste. And they're able to describe these characters with quite sophisticated language. Here's the thing. I don't know yet, and I don't know if anybody ever will know you, you know, to what extent does having access to all this vocabulary improve how they think about these characters? You know, do they think about the characters differently because they've got ways to describe them? I would probably hazard a guess at yes. Yeah, I would think so as well. Christian, what, when you were talking there about uh, a number of the the, the things that you were mentioning, the app, et cetera, and the way that you uh, approach this. I kept thinking about games or so computer games, for example, a lot of computer games mm. that have puzzles offer the player of those games the option of asking for hints, is mm. what you were saying. Um, and that quite often um, is something that, the players of those games will try not to ask mm. ask for the hints because they want yeah. to do it without the hints, but they always yeah. know that if it gets too difficult that they've got the hints to rely upon that will help them move on and solve the puzzles, et cetera. So this is a little bit like that, I think, in a way. Yeah, exactly. spot on, yeah. Look, Duolingo, you know, the market leaders, obviously, for learning languages. Mm. You know, it's... Uh, and, and all the apps that the children have got, it's an attention game. Um, yeah. You know, we want to keep hold of their attention for as long as possible. Um, all, all I can say to you is, is that, you know, I'll also share with you, there's a little bit of work around identifying children that need help. And we know, you know, if, if there were any benefactors out there that have had, a, you know, a difficult schooling and have turned things around, you know, um, that want to help, we're pretty confident that there is, information within remember more that will help some very key children in school get the help that they need because of course we're able to see how quickly uh, children take to respond and we've got children that have very very high and correct response rates but have very very slow decision times for me as a teacher that information is is just phenomenal now i have that because uh you know obviously uh, as a as the data administrator, remember more, I can look at that information. We don't share that globally with teachers, mm -hmm. but I'm pretty confident if I had the time, we would be able to say to schools, you know, look, well done. These children are doing their homework, but we think there might be a reading deficit here, or there might be a decision-making deficit here. Um, you know, 
go and have a look. That that's my dream. At the moment, we've kind of run out a little bit of time, and um, and Alex Warren, the developer, is is still full time developing. So we're not spending as much time on it as we once were. Um, but that's the step that we'd really like to take. So you know, it's it's some really interesting information in there. Um, you know, set aside children being confident, knowing more. You know, teaching's a lot more fun because I'm really doing the the interesting stuff because the app takes care of the the more mundane stuff. But there's a real um, educational question here: is if we can identify those children that have working memory deficits um, and give that information back to teachers, would we teach differently? And the answer is, of course, we would. Um, yeah. So that's that's as far as the project's got. Um, it's all been done with kind of blood, sweat, and tears. So, yeah, we're quite excited at the moment. We just, you know, we'd like to see more people use it. So, hence, um, conversations with people like yourself, Graham, you know, are important. Excellent. Well, I think that's probably a good moment to finish on, Christian. I want to thank you very much for for talking to me today. I'm, uh, I'm fascinated with uh, the work that you've been doing and, and test and enhanced learning and the uh, Remember What app as well. I think it's a really great uh great thing and i hope that a lot of people after listening to this will go out and get your book and start um doing the same as well no i really appreciate it you know and i'll be honest my incentive is that they get to spend more time you know teaching the parts of their curriculum that they enjoy and and ironically mine isn't so much about the book and the app is is them spending time you know I, i think teaching at the moment is such a hard profession um, yes. This is our little contribution to to try and make it a bit more manageable, so that they can enjoy. You know, they shouldn't be working as hard. There's no reason. You know, Macbeth hasn't changed. You know, for 400 years. <laughs> so, you know, I'm hoping I'm hoping that this work will help. And you know, I'm also looking forward to one day um, hooking up and uh, going out for Mexican because it is absolutely our favourite food, and it's actually my birthday meal, Mexican tonight. Just so you know that, Greg. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Um, well, if you get the chance, I don't know if you if it will be on the menu, but if you get a chance to try mole, if you haven't tried it already, right? then I recommend it. it. Mole, M-O-L-E, is this uh, sort of, there are varieties of it, but there's sauces that the brown mole is, of, is made with chocolate and almonds and et cetera. And it's, it's an acquired taste, but it's it's absolutely delicious. So I recommend that. Well, I'll add that to the list. And it's been really nice talking to you tonight. Uh, So I really appreciate that. Thanks, Graham. Great. Well, enjoy the rest of your birthday weekend. And, uh, and, yeah, I look forward to reading the book, which I haven't read yet, but I will definitely do so. Well, as I said, if I can help, and, you know, we're uh, we're pretty available these days, but, you know, I'd love to catch up and uh, take forward the conversation. So thanks for your time, Graham. Okay. Thanks a lot, Christian. Cheers, then. Bye now. Bye. So that brings us, everybody, to the end of today's Twilight Show. Uh, Many thanks to today's special guest, Christian Still, and all of you who joined us live. And remember, Christian's book, Test Enhanced Learning, is available from www.crownhouse.co.uk forward slash test dash enhanced dash learning. And I'll leave you with another quotation from the description of the book that's on the website. The book goes a step ahead Beyond mere retrieval practice, offering a fresh approach to test enhanced learning, both pre-testing and post-testing, supported by real classroom-based routines that have been tried and tested by both primary and secondary teachers across a range of subjects. Exploring the research behind test enhanced learning, it reveals that both pre-testing and post-testing retrieval practice offers improved memorization and secures long-term learning. And so that's it for me. There are teachers talk radio shows all week on all manner of interesting topics. So please join in live or listen to the recordings afterwards. And I hope you'll join join me again next week at the same time. Bye for now. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.